Princess Bride, Chapter 3, The Courtship Four of them met in the great council room of the castle. Prince Humperdinck, his confidant, Count Rugen, his father, aging King Lotharon, and Queen Bella, his evil stepmother. Queen Bella was shaped like a gumdrop and colored like a raspberry. She was easily the most beloved person in the kingdom and had been married to the king long before he began mumbling. Prince Humperdinck was but a child then, and since the only stepmothers he knew were the evil ones from stories, he always called Bella that, or E.S. for short. All right, the prince began when they were all assembled. Who do I marry? Let's pick a bride and get it done. Aging King Lotharon said, I've been thinking it's really getting to be about time for Humperdinck to pick a bride. He didn't actually so much say that as mumble it. I mean mumble, 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 and mumble. Queen Bella was the only one who bothered ferreting out his meanings anymore. You couldn't be righter, dear, she said, and she patted his royal robes. What did he say? He said whoever we decided on would be getting a thunderously handsome prince for a lifetime companion. Tell him he's looking quite well himself, the prince returned. We've only just changed miracle men, the queen said. That accounts for the improvement. You mean you fired Miracle Max, Prince Humperdinck said. I thought he was the only one left. No, we found another one up in the mountains, and he's quite extraordinary. Old, of course, but then who wants a young miracle man? Tell them I've changed miracle men, King Lotharon said. It came out, tell mumble, mumble, mumble. What did he say? The prince wondered. He said a man of your importance couldn't marry just any princess. True, true, Prince Humperdinck said. He sighed deeply. I suppose that means Narina. That would certainly be a perfect match politically, Count Rugen allowed. Princess Narina was from Gilder, the country that lay just across Florin Channel. In Gilder, they put it differently. For them, Florin was the country on the other side of the channel of Gilder. In any case, the two countries had stayed alive over the centuries mainly by warring on each other. There had been the Olive War, the tuna fish discrepancy, which almost bankrupted both nations, the Roman Rift, which did send them both into insolvency, only to be followed by the discord of the Emeralds, in which they both got rich again, chiefly by banding together for a brief period and robbing everybody within sailing distance. I wonder if she hunts, though, said Humperdinck. I don't care so much about personality, just so they're good with a knife. I saw her several years ago, Queen Bella said. She seemed lovely, though hardly muscular. I would describe her more as a knitter than a doer, but again, lovely. Skin? asked the prince. Marblish, answered the queen. Lips? Number or color? asked the queen. Color, yes. Rosish. Cheeks the same, eyes largish, one blue, one green. Hmm, said Humperdinck. And form? Hourglassish, always clothed divinishly. And, of course, famous throughout Gilder for the largest hat collection in the world. Well, let's bring her over here for some state occasions and have a look at her, said the prince. Isn't there are princes in Gilder that would be about the right age, said the king. It came out, mumble, mumble. Are you never wrong, said Queen Bella, and she smiled into the weakening eyes of her ruler. What did he say, wondered the prince. That I should leave this very day with an invitation, replied the queen. So began the great visit of the princess Narina. Me again. Of all the cuts in this version, I feel most justified in making this one. Just as the chapters on Wailing and Moby Dick can be omitted by all but the most punishment-loving readers, so the packing scenes that Morgan Stern details here are really best left alone. That's what happens for the next 56 and a half pages of The Princess Bride. Packing. I include unpacking scenes in the same category. What happens is just this. Queen Bella packs most of her wardrobe. 11 pages, and travels to Gilder, 2 pages. In Gilder, she unpacks, 5 pages, and then tenders the invitation to Princess Narina, 1 page. 
Princess Norina accepts one page. Then Princess Norina packs all her clothes and hats, 23 pages. And together, the princess and the queen travel back to Florin for the annual celebration of the founding of Florin City, one page. They reach King Lothron's castle, where Princess Norina is shown her quarters, half page, and unpacks all the same clothes and hats we've just seen her pack one and a half pages before, 12 pages. It's a baffling passage. I spoke to Professor Bongiorno of Columbia University, the head of their Florinese department, and he said this was the most deliciously satiric chapter in the entire book, Morgenstern's point, apparently, being simply to show that although Florin considered itself vastly more civilized than Gilder, Gilder was, in fact, the far more sophisticated country as indicated by the superiority in number and quality of the ladies' clothes. I'm not about to argue with a full professor, but if you ever have a really unbreakable case of insomnia, do yourself a favor and start reading chapter three of the uncut version. Anyway, things pick up a bit once the prince and princess meet and spend the day. Norina did have, as advertised, marbleish skin, rosish lips and cheeks, largish eyes, one blue, one green, hourglassish form, and easily the most extraordinary collection of hats ever assembled. Wide-brimmed and narrow, some tall, some not, some fancy, some colorful, some plaid, some plain. She doted on changing hats at every opportunity. When she met the prince, she was wearing one hat. When he asked her for a stroll, she excused herself shortly to return wearing another, equally flattering. Things went on like this throughout the day, but it seems to me to be a bit too much court etiquette for modern readers, so it's not till the evening meal that I return to the original text. Dinner was held in the great hall of Lotharon's castle. Ordinarily, they would have all supped in the dining room, but for an event of this importance, that place was simply too small. So tables were placed end to end along the center of the great hall, an enormous drafty spot that was given to being chilly even in the summertime. There were many doors and giant entrance ways, and the wind gusts sometimes reached gale force. This night was more typical than less, the winds whistled constantly and the candles constantly needed relighting, and some of the more daringly dressed ladies shivered. But Prince Humperdinck didn't seem to mind, and in Florin, if he didn't, you didn't either. At 8.23, there seemed every chance of a lasting alliance starting between Florin and Gilder. At 8.24, the two nations were very close to war. What happened was simply this. At 8.23 and 5 seconds, the main course of the evening was ready for serving. The main course was essence of brandied pig, and you need a lot of it to serve 500 people. So in order to hasten the serving, a giant double door that led from the kitchen to the great hall was opened. The giant double door was on the north end of the room. The door remained open throughout what followed. The proper wine for essence of brandied pig was in readiness behind the double door that led eventually to the wine cellar. This double door was opened at 8.23 in 10 seconds in order that the dozen wine stewards could get their kegs quickly to the eaters. This double door, it might be noted, was at the south end of the room. At this point, an unusually strong crosswind was nearly evident. Prince Humperdinck did not notice because at that moment he was whispering with the Princess Norina of Gilder. He was cheek to cheek with her, his head under her wide-brimmed blue-green hat, which brought out the exquisite color in both of her largish eyes. At 8.23 and 20 seconds, King Lotharon made his somewhat belated entrance to the dinner. He was always belated now, had been for years, and in the past, people had just been known to starve before he got there. But of late, meals just began without him, which was fine with him since his new miracle man had taken him off meals anyway. The king entered through the king's door, a huge hinged thing that only he was allowed to use. It took several servants in excellent condition to work it. It should be reported that the king's door was always in the east side of any room since the king was, of all people, closest to the sun. What happened then has been variously described as a northern or a southwestern, depending on where you were seated in the room when it struck, but all hands agree on one thing. At 8.23 and 25 seconds, it was pretty gusty in the Great Hall. Most of the candles lost their flames and toppled, which was only important because a few of them fell, still burning, into the small kerosene cups that were placed here and there across the banquet table so that the essence of brandied pig could be properly flaming when served. 
Servants rushed in from all over to put out the flames, and they did a good enough job, considering that everything in the room was flying this way, that way, fans and scarves and hats, particularly the hat of Princess Norina. It flew off the wall behind her, where she quickly retrieved it and put it properly on. That was at 8.23 and 50 seconds. It was too late. At 8.23.55, Prince Humperdinck rose roaring, the veins in his thick neck etched like hemp. There were still flames in some places, and their redness reddened his already blood-filled face. He looked, as he stood there, like a barrel on fire. He then said to Princess Norina of Gilder the five words that brought the nations to the brink. Madam, feel free to flee! And with that, he stormed from the Great Hall. The time was then 8.24. Prince Humperdinck made his angry way to the balcony above the Great Hall and stared down at the chaos. The fires were still in places flaming red, guests were pouring out through the doors, and Princess Norina, hatted and faint, was being carried by her servants far from view. Queen Bella finally caught up with the prince, who stormed along the balcony, clearly not yet in control. I do wish you hadn't been quite so blunt, Queen Bella said. The prince whirled on her. I'm not marrying any bald princess, and that's that. No one would know, Queen Bella explained. She has hats even for sleeping. I would know, cried the prince. Did you see the candlelight reflecting off her skull? But things would have been so good with Gilder, the queen said, addressing herself half to the prince, half to Count Rugen, who now joined them. Forget about Gilder. I'll conquer it sometime. I've been wanting to ever since I was a kid anyway. He approached the queen. People snicker behind your back when you've got a bald wife, and I can do without that, thank you. You'll just have to find someone else. Who? Find me somebody. She should just look nice, that's all. The Marina has no hair, King Lotharon said, puffing up to the others. Normal, mumble humble. Thank you for pointing that out, dear, said Queen Bella. I don't think Humperdinck will like that, said the king. Dumble humble mumble. Then Count Rugen stepped forward. You want someone who looks nice, but what if she's a commoner? The commoner, the better, Prince Humperdinck replied, pacing again. What if she can't hunt, the count went on. I don't care if she can't spell, the prince said. Suddenly, he stopped and faced them all. I'll tell you what I want, he began then. I want someone who is so beautiful that when you see her, you say, Wow, that Humperdinck must be some kind of fella to have a wife like that. Search the country, search the world, just find her. Count Rugen could only smile. She is already found, he said. It was dawn when the two horsemen reined in at the hilltop. Count Rugen rode a splendid black horse, large, perfect, powerful. The prince rode one of his whites. It made Rugen's mount seem like a plow puller. She delivers milk in the mornings, Count Rugen said. And she is truly without question no possibility of error or beautiful. She was something of a mess when I saw her, the Count admitted. But the potential was overwhelming. A milkmaid. The prince ran the words across his rough tongue. I don't know that I could wed one of them even under the best of conditions. People might snicker that she was the best I could do. True, the Count admitted. If you prefer, we can ride back to Florin City without waiting. We've come this far, the prince said. We might as well wait. His voice quite simply died. I'll take her, he managed, finally, as Buttercup rode slowly by below them. No one will snicker, I think, the Count said. I must court her now, said the Prince. Leave us alone for a minute. He rode the white expertly down the hill. Buttercup had never seen such a giant beast, or such a rider. I am your Prince, and you will marry me, Humperdinck said. Buttercup whispered, I am your servant, and I refuse. I am your prince, and you cannot refuse. I am your loyal servant, and I just did. Refusal means death. Kill me, then. I am your prince, and I'm not that bad. How could you rather be dead than married to me? Because, Buttercup said, marriage involves love, 
and that is not a pastime at which I excel. I tried once, and it went badly, and I am sworn never to love another. Love? said Prince Humperdinck. Who mentioned love? Not me, I can tell you. Look, there must always be a male heir to the throne of Florin. That's me. Once my father dies, there won't be an heir, just a king. That's me again. When that happens, I'll marry and have children until there is a son. So you can either marry me and be the richest and most powerful woman in a thousand miles and give turkeys away at Christmas and provide me a son, or you can die in terrible pain in the very near future. Make up your own mind. I'll never love you. I wouldn't want it if I had it. Then, by all means, let us marry. 